Hi, good morning, everybody. So it's in front of an extremely large audience <laughs> uh, that I'm going to talk to you about uh, the PostgreSQL development process today. Uh, this is not a talk uh, about hacking. Uh, this is a talk about personal experience, about how uh, we work within the community and how uh, we get things done in it uh, based on some my own experience and some input I actually have to, to offer. So the title of the talk itself is how to get a feature committed because wh when you send a patch, your final goal is actually to get something merged into Postgres. So why would you want to do that? Why? Sorry. I forgot that one. Uh, no, normally I don't have 10 minutes between two slides, so it should be fine. It's an automatic uh, switch off. Anyway, uh, so you want to get something merged. Why would you actually want to do that? Uh, why is it worth it? So I'm going to try to explain to you this morning why uh, and a couple of reasons why it's actually worth it. So let's keep going. So about myself, that's just a small uh, presentation slide. My name is Michael Paquier. Uh, I am French, French based in Tokyo. Uh, and I'm contributing to PostgreSQL uh, since 2009. Uh, I got, I'm actually contributing to, to PostgreSQL since I live in Japan, because I'm in the country there for 10 years. I got in a job that uh, was for NTT back in the days, and I got introduced to PostgreSQL. And since that point in time, I'm continuing just to work on it, and I just keep uh, enjoying it and still do what I like, so it's nice. Uh, I do uh, patch reviews. I send patches to hackers. You may have seen my name from time to time. I try to do a couple of things. Uh, I don't know how many patches I have contributed to Postgres. A lot of small things, mainly a lot of features. Uh, to my surprise, there has been a feature I was working uh, for Postgres 12, uh, on which I have been working on since 2012 of our project that I get basically gave up in 2014. Somebody picked it up and somebody else committed it. Uh, it happens that I perhaps have to maintain this thing now, but well, it's really a cool feature. It's called re-index concurrently. Um, so I do some blogging, patch review. I work with the community. And uh, PostgreSQL has named me a uh, committer of the project uh, since 2014. So this talk also includes my own experience in being a committer, what it means, and what actually are the consequences about trying to do anything involving Postgres. Uh, I'm working for VMware, where I'm doing a couple of things like uh, anything related to packaging, PostgreSQL integration, support for customers, as well as support for people using Postgres and trying to integrate uh, it as well. So anything touching Postgres usually comes into, oh, you are the Postgres guy, and requests just come in, and it's just the point of taking care of that and try to make people happy as much as possible, or, ac or at least to extinguish fires as much as I can. Uh, so that's about me. So about the community of PostgreSQL itself. Uh, so you're here, so it's a database, it's a core database engine in charge of passing the data, receiving the thing, in charge of the protocol, planning, executing, and it's here to make sure that anything that you put in Postgres, you can actually get it back because that's the whole point of the database. Uh, it has a steady uh, design, uh, its development process, uh, is perhaps slow for some enterprise uh, class people, but we take it slow because we want it to think about Postgres in the long term, as a very, very long term pro uh, project. We still want it to be, uh, we still want the project to be around in 20, 30 years. So we take it in a steady pace and we try to design features in a shape that they would still serve us to extend more PostgreSQL even in the future. It's a worldwide investment. We have contributors from all over the world. Uh, the release notes include the name of the individuals who have worked on that. I, I don't actually know how many names we have on that, but we have a couple of hundred people contributed, contributing into the hackers mailing list where uh, the PostgreSQL features are dealt with. Uh, since 2018, we have a code of conduct 
that defines uh, how uh, the PostgreSQL people should actually work around that. Uh, PostgreSQL is, uh, you may, who knows actually about the DP engine ranking, which is a kind of reference about database engine references around. So it basically says the higher your score, the more popular you actually are. Uh, PostgreSQL is number four into that. The first three, uh, you most likely know about them. Uh, this is around, I think, for something like 10 years now. And PostgreSQL is keeping a huge growth. And within the last couple of years, it's the database engine listed at least by that, which has the highest uh, growth uh, rate of uh, growth. So it's actually growing uh, much than all the other ones. So I like to think about PostgreSQL as a product. It's an open source community. We try to work together. It's open source, it's BSD licensed, which means that you can just take the code, compile it by yourself, modify it as you want. You can redistrib redistribute it, resell it if you want. But I'm just going to say that uh, forks are, well, have a cost. You fork something, you maintain it, and actually you have to maintain it. And people usually in my own experience tend to really underestimate the cost it takes to uh, maintain a fork in itself. So if you like what you do, perhaps the community does not, you may still want to fork it. But you need to think also in terms of long-term prospects, which means that you actually, what you get into PostgreSQL itself may not be at the first what you actually are looking for. But in my own experience, you actually fi finish with something which is actually much better than what you thought first, because you get input from people you are not usually working with, but work on Postgres for a very, very long time. So may, they may have input to offer to you, which gives more value to what you are looking for. So some people uh, who are also in this audience uh, are able to live uh, with this model. And they have actually, with the time, a huge customer base that allows them to maintain this model till they try uh, to, I guess, catch up with PostgreSQL as much as they can. And they try to, at least I can see in, in the last uh, 10 years or so, that people tend to see that, uh, OK, that was nice to do that in the first days, but it's harder to contribute first in Postgres. But if I think about that in like 10, 20 years, uh, it's going to be kind of difficult to maintain something which is more uh, like, like a fork like that. So it's really hard to contribute in PostgreSQL for the first time, for the first patches. Most likely, you are going to get your first patch rejected. Most likely, uh, I would say, 30 or 40% of the time, Tom is going to pop in and say, no, sorry, minus one. Uh, there is a famous C-shot on that. Uh, in short, minus one, uh, Tom Lane. Uh, it happens that it's something which is very, very difficult to say. Uh, it takes experience and time. But usually, if somebody who is working on Postgres for a very long time tells you so, they have there are very good reasons that it's actually is the case. So the initial time to do the development or to get used to it requires an initial investment, an initial investment from the company doing that. But if you think about that in terms of years and not short-term perspectives, it's actually you have a lot to gain from that. Uh, speaking from my own experience, uh, in my company, we have been maintaining a fork before I joined of PostgreSQL uh, using 9.0, 9.1, 9.2. Uh, we have decided to switch to 9.3, and we have deeply cut the amount of time we actually had to maintain our custom patches. And at the end, we were kind of, oh, actually, it's fine. So if you can use upstream, uh, try to plug into upstream. You can plug into upstream, upstream with your own extensions and break Postgres in many uh, awful and a lot of ways. Uh, just for example, use some of the hooks, try to plug into the planner hook or do anything. Uh, most likely, the first attempts of doing anything are going to break some, somewhere Postgres, most likely. So 
and the PostgreSQL community is managed by a set of uh, many individuals, be they committer, hackers, reviewers, uh, people working on extension on the community ecosystem that have, I don't know, I'm just writing dozens of man years, but I think it may be actually way more than that, perhaps a couple of hundred man years or, uh, I, I'm not going to say a thousand, but I have absolutely no idea. But if you gather the total time of everybody working on that, you can most likely have a very, very huge number of that. So there is an experience behind that and people who have worked on Postgres. So the database engine itself is an ACID uh, compliant uh, thing. Uh, ACID is uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, as you may know about that. Uh, it's MVCC based. Uh, if you are here, you most likely know about that. Uh, it's free to use as much as free is defined, which is that you can actually use it, but the cost of running it, maintaining it, uh, doing DPT and DBA work on it is actually up to you normally. Uh, it's open engineering, open discussion, open to new and good and even sharp ideas. It's even open to bad ideas because it's good to actually, even if you think you have a good idea, somebody shows, show, shows that and say, oh, actually it's not a good idea. It's good that you actually mention your idea on the list because somebody else has a look at it, say, oh, actually somebody has tried to propose that in the past and you have a past reference about that. So usually keep around the reasons. The PostgreSQL archives uh, hold uh, a trace of the exchanges happening on hackers since 1996, right? Uh, since the, the first uh, project uh, has actually risen up in PostgreSQL.org. So if you browse up the archives, you try to look for past ideas, you may be able to find stuff related to what you would actually like to propose about that. It's highly pluggable. You can do many things like data types, plugin. We have an extension uh, ecosystem. You can do a lot of fancy stuff on that. And we try to make PostgreSQL more and more pluggable, such as not only we have a database engine, but we have what I would perhaps say a database platform, which is that we try to make Postgres more and more pluggable, more and more usable. So this has also a danger that perhaps PostgreSQL core itself is BSD, but we may see the rise of more and more property closed source, which tries to plug in on top of Postgres. Uh, Andres mentioned that yesterday of, about table AM. Table AM, I think is, I think my cool feature for Postgres 12, I'm actually playing with it. And it's really cool uh, from a hacker point of view, uh, but you have risks also behind that. Uh, risks about closed source means that it's also up to you to maintain it and actually to run it. So if you, you know, it's a balance. You may be able to pay for that or perhaps not. It depends on your, on what you actually want to do. Uh, the code quality is really, really extremely high uh, based on some past experiences. Uh, enterprise internal code usually uh, has a lot of hacks, XXX to do, you know, uh, stuff like that about things which are actually not documented at all. Under uh, documented, sometimes magic. Uh, in Postgres, we try to avoid that. If you have a comment, there is a good reason behind that. Uh, the commit logs are also have an extremely high quality these days. If you take back the commit logs from perhaps 15 years ago, they were not as good as now, but it means that people have gained in attention and gained in quality about what they contribute into Postgres. So likely the quality is really, really nice to see. Uh, so, the people in charge of merging code into Postgres, I would say the kind of guardians of Postgres, are a set of committers, people who are allowed to uh, push uh, code into the main repository itself. So the distribution is really worldwide. Uh, based on the counts of this week, uh, there are 29 people listed as committers of the PostgreSQL project. Seven people have been newly named, uh, including myself, uh, last year. We have one new committer this week, and actually the new guy, I didn't know that, uh, he's in uh, New Zealand as, as well, so we have actually now two people in Oceania, which is actually more, more or less in the same time zone as I do. I think I'm listing myself in the Europe one, I don't think I'm in the Asia one, anyway. Uh, but we have people really from a lot of places, uh, mainly uh, in North America, US and Europe has the main attention, but I see uh, also a lot of people from 
Asian countries or even Oceania or even other continents trying to contribute back and uh, contribute uh, directly to Postgres. So PostgreSQL uh, has a yearly, uh, basically a yearly release schedule. So we try to release a new major version of Postgres every year, which happens basically in September. And we have a development schedule where we basically have uh, a period where we discuss and integrate new features. It's still possible to discuss new features in this other stability period, but we try to have things divided basically in two uh, pairs of time. You have the feature submission disc discussion that happens from July to April based on the latest trends. Uh, and we, after April, we have uh, something called the feature freeze, which is now uh, actually a process handled by the release management team, which is a release of a couple of individuals in charge of making sure that the release is able to come to pace and that we are able to release things in time. Depending on the issues, there could be a couple of months in between. But we try to push things such as we keep things stable and on time for a release such as we are able to keep some pace, at least for the last couple of years. So after the feature freeze, we have a period really focused on stability, uh, roughly from April to September, where in September we try to say we have a .o which is basically uh, ready uh, to be used by people. And we have also some beta releases, like one, two beta releases on top of that. So once you release something, we, in Git, not all open source projects do that, but we have one branch, which is uh, for the stable work. Stable branches do not have new features. They have only bug fixes. Anything that crashes, anything which is considered, I would say, as a regression, even sometimes it depends on the cases. But we try to really focus on the stability of the thing in itself. Uh, stable branch is maintained for five years uh, after the GA release. So uh, PostgreSQL 12, which is planned for this, uh, for, uh, this September, basically, would be maintained until uh, 2024. And this year, we will have, uh, at the same time, Basically, I would say uh, it's one minor release after the five-year uh, window, which should be, I guess, in November. Uh, 9.4 will get its EOL, and we are not going to maintain it on the community side. So this means that if you use a given version of Postgres, you basically have a window of five years that you can use uh, for upgrading uh, your instances. So this may sound short from an enterprise point of view because normally you release a product, you have uh, support maintenance policies. So you either have to choose between keeping up your product to use the newest version or you need to maintain a custom stable branch by yourself. But from the community point of view, it's five years and patching one bug fix across basically six to seven branches is a lot of work. You can believe me on this one. Even simple things, you need to make sure that you ha introduce no regressions. Sometimes some areas of the code change slightly in some weird way, which cause actually the patch to break in some cases. So it's not as e easy as it is. Applying the feature is only one single branch, so people are like, okay, it's okay, so that's fine to do it. Uh, bug fixes get much more tricky uh, in this uh, area. I, I got a couple of months ago uh, bug fix about synchronous replication, which had to go down to 9.4. I'm doing that from time to time as well. Uh, we have much improved testing framework since 9.6. And so you finish by either uh, backpatching the testing framework to test it by yourself, or do some bashing or some manual testing or anything like that. It happens that in many cases, I have in my own GitHub, a version of the testing framework which is compatible with the past version such as I can still rely on it in case if I need to. There are a couple of hacks around that because I'm rather lazy on that, but it works and I was able to rely on it. Uh, it was about the, if you look for that, it was last summer about the consistency points uh, issues on standbys. So we have some test cases now. Yep. 
Uh, yeah, you, you knew this one. Sorry? What's your name? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I see where you are. <laughs> yep, yep. So we, uh, you may be happy to know that we actually have a test case for that now. So it's not going to break again normally, or at least the build time is going to complain before. Uh, the test case has been added in 12, but you can always run it on the back branches as well. That's basically what I did uh, also for some of my posts. Uh, so I it means, sorry? I learned a lot by testing. Uh, sorry? I learned really a lot by doing this investigation and assessing between the methods and the data files. So you gained more experience with uh, the stupid stuff I did, so uh, which is uh, good actually for you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's part of the experience as well. If you don't do any mistakes, you don't actually, uh, uh, I mean, anybody is going to do mistakes anyway, so. Uh, it's just being proactive about them, taking responsibility about them is something that, as a committer, is very, very important. As a patch author, I think it's also very important to follow up on things and to show up that you are willing to help in maintaining things, even if you're not the one who actually merged the patch as well. Um, that's based on my experience. So uh, for the development cycle, uh, things are divided into commit fests. We have in the last uh, five or six years or so, uh, four to five commit fests. Uh, since PostgreSQL 10, uh, since the 10 release cycle, we are, have actually five running from June to uh, the end of March, which are one month period where we say, we will try to commit uh, patches, review them. We have a list of patches uh, listed in a dedicated app called the Commit Fest app, uh, which is on this URL directly. Uh, six, seven years ago, we had up to 120 patches to deal with. It happens that lately, uh, not only patches do accumulate, but more and more people contribute to Postgres. And we have lately to deal with up to 250 patches in the commit fest app uh, itself. And we have one month of break between each, but it happens also that uh, a feature could also get committed uh, in between depending on the talk. Yeah, it really depends on the cases. Uh, this can happen as well, but we try really to keep things uh, into this period, at least to keep a track of that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I have committed myself stuff. I'm pretty sure I have committed stuff myself for new features in between commit fest as well. I mean, it's still within the development period itself, so I don't think it's actually a huge uh, big deal. For example, it's a refactoring or it's something or it's even a new feature. It happens. It depends on your time, on what's, how you can actually allocate that. So it's not a strong rule, but actually it's really to say we have that and some and a lot of patch authors or reviewers tend to focus really on this period and, you know, they need a break after <laughs> because it's a huge uh, work happening. Even if you send one, two patches for newcomers, it's a process to get dive, really to dive into it, to work, to work with it, to get used to it. It's a huge process and it's a lot to take usually for people. So it's good to have breaks actually because you can actually rest on it and just, uh, you know, take a coffee or a set of coffees for a full month until you are able to move on and battle back uh, into, into the battlefield. Uh, so uh, regarding the stability period, uh, we have after the feature freeze a first beta which we try to release uh, just before uh, PGCon. Uh, this year we have released it uh, actually one week ago I'm not seeing that many uh, issues yet, new issues. So we have a couple of things, but I'm not seeing anything new and huge. I may be wrong on that, Mr. Lane. <laughs> Do we have any huge new open issues since we released beta one? Not really that much. Uh, yeah, we have issues that were open for beta one. Yeah, really, I don't think so. so 
it means that you guys here are not you doing your homework, which is to test Postgres and report back issues to us. If you think it's an issue, please tell us. Perhaps it's not an issue, but at least let's discuss about it. So please do your work. We try also to do as much as we can, but everybody has a limited time slot. So if you have some spare time, you know what to do. Uh, and of course, during this stability period, it's of course up usually to the committers to fix stuff, but help in stabilizing things is actually good because you show involvement in the community process. In my, experience, in my own experience, people like writing cool stuff, fancy code, because you know, they are cool, they are fancy. But you need still to go behind, perhaps rethink portion of them. It's not as cool as, as fancy, but working also on the stability issues, working on making sure that what you have at the end is something that customers can, customers, users, so your customers can actually rely on, is also uh, something that I think is as important as writing cool, fancy, and uh, nicely shaped code. Uh, I don't like complicating my things myself. I would rather delete code than adding new code if it's actually to add more value in terms of the long-term maintenance and if it actually makes sense. Sometimes, of course, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I, but I really like simple things. That's why even complicated features sometimes can find their way through it if you cut it into simple pieces. So I think it's good also to help in stabilizing things and showing involvement in that. Uh, but cool features are also cool because, you know, they have big items on the release notes and you say, wow, that's cool. And it attracts even more customers. But sometimes people tend to forget about the part where you actually need to maintain the actual thing that has been committed in itself. So about the commit first management, uh, as I mentioned before, we have up to 250 patches uh, lately, which is a lot to deal with. Uh, based on the patterns that I can see, uh, we have few rejections, meaning that we don't want that. Please don't submit again, basically. Uh, for us, we could have more, I think. Uh, we have a lot of patches, which are what we call return with feedback, which is, uh, it's cool, but you could perhaps, if you do it this way, it's not like we don't want it, but we don't want it in this shape. So please rework it and resend it uh, once again for a follow-up commit first. Uh, we have also a pattern which is sad. So normally if you say, I have 250 patches, all my patches are going to be treated for this commit fest. This never happens. We have a lot of patches getting bumped from one commit fest to the other because people don't care about them, don't have the time to treat them, to have, have some interest in it, but we have a lot of patches getting moved from one commit fest to the other, and we have even patches that get into the commit fest for many commit fests and nobody actually cares much about them. If we don't actually care about them, usually it means that we don't want them, so by default they get uh, either returned with feedback but never actually rejected. And something is, is that uh, everybody forgets about patches. So you have your daily work, you have your daily life, you have a lot of things that can, can get into the involvement or actually the huge and motivated involvement that you have or you want to give to the community. But I can see that authors forget about their patches, reviewers also forget to review and register their names for a given patch. So please have a follow-up of what you submit. If you say to within the commit test application that you sent a patch and somebody has uh, sent a review for it, just send a small email, sorry, I don't have the time this month, I'm not going to make it, uh, please, uh, I'm going to send that once again. And we are able to move on with that. But people tend to actually not do that. Say, honestly, sorry, I don't have the time, perhaps I will, but I'm not exactly sure. So it's good if you show uh, also good and fast involvement because it's less work for the people actually doing the management work of the 250 patches. Uh, trying to do the vacuum, vacuuming work for 250 patches requires, in my own experience, something like six to eight hours of focus and still you make a lot of mistakes. 
And at the end of the day, you need not only a good coffee, but really a good double black coffee. Uh, if you think that moving, I mean, obtaining the status in your patch, such as it's not sitting down in itself, and you think it's adapted, yes, uh, please do it by yourself, because it's less work for the for the individual, which I think I'm mentioning on my next slide. No, I'm actually not, but uh, uh, perhaps I have that. But uh, we have a commit first manager. The commit first manager is here to make sure that the commit first finishes at some point, at least that. We try to make it finish on time. So if you do it by yourself, it's a huge uh, help for it because uh, the commit first manager cannot really do, it's not physically or psychologically possible to do a close follow-up of each patch. But as a patch author, as a patch reviewer, you actually know about the patch and its situation usually much better than the commit first manager, which could a little bit misjudge. Uh, a given patch. So if you can move in by yourself, yes, uh, please, uh, definitely, yes, do it. Even if it's a small patch, uh, a couple of people still keep uh, monitoring of that. I do it. Uh, if I can, I, I see a patch, uh, it, it should come in as soon as possible. I try to actually to follow up on that. Some other people do that. Uh, Tom here does that. We have other committers who do uh, this kind of work as well. Uh, but it's good to update the commit fest app, uh, really. As much as you can. Uh, so this is a small graph about each commit fest. Uh, in the commit fest app itself, commit fest are numbered using an integer. So this is actually the integer. So if you do go into the commit fest.postgresql.org and then append the number, you would actually bump into the commit fest that we've been doing. And that would be the commit fest back. We have data in this commit fest app back to 20. We have 22, 23, five commit fest a year, five, six years. So perhaps 2014, right? I don't have the commit fest app down, down here. And that's basically a trend uh, of all the data that you have. Uh, usually patches never stay in, so that they have a final status which is either committed, rejected, written with feedback, moved, and we have a new status called withdrawn, which is an author submitted it, but actually I say, no, it's not a good idea, so he's just giving up on the patch by himself. Uh, so the trend is that patches are just basically growing, even if we have a steady state for the last two years or so of 20, uh, 200, 250 or so patches. And there is a kind of spike about the committed portion, which matches to the last commit fest of a release cycle, because people tend to have stuff, uh, much more stuff committed in the last commit fest. Uh, as you can see, uh, there are a lot of patches also moved from one commit fest to the other, meaning that we have a steady state as well, but you don't have actually that many new patches uh, coming it uh, either. So the total is also perhaps we may want stats where we want to compare the amount of unique things uh, that uh, are kept around because many entries keep being around for two, three commit fests. So it's not the pure total, it's the total of current entries uh, in the commit fest itself. In terms of unique things, I don't have exact numbers about that, but you can see the historic or about how many times a single patch has been moved to the commit fest, but it's a little bit harder actually to track that in the commit fest app. So it's not an exact number, it's a current state of things. But if you take the full total, it's not, it doesn't mean that we have like, uh, I don't know, 200, two, 2,000, 3,000 patches, no, it doesn't mean that. It just means that we have also a lot of things that got around and not as many patches as you, as you would think by looking at them. So about the patch submission, we have guidelines on the wiki. Normally, if you send a patch, you send it first to hackers for discussion, you register it into the commit fest app. Uh, work in progress patches are fine. Uh, you are working on a cool thing. It's a complicated thing, particularly if you are working on a complicated thing, Please discuss first. It's very, very important. You may have a work in, in, a work in progress. It may be cool, 
but sometimes it's good to have a discussion or even a rough draft of something working, which perhaps you've been doing, say, in one, two days, but it's much better in having something rough in one, two days that you are ready to show up, like, oh, I have this cool feature, what do you think? And I would like to do that and begin discussing on that, then spending one or two months working on something, sending it to the committee, uh, sending it to the committee just to have it rejected immediately. So think when you implement a new feature about having uh, even hacky or rough uh, stuff uh, done in a short time frame first, discuss it, decide its design based on the interests of people. And something which matters a lot also is if people are actually interested in that as well. It may not be worth moving on with a feature that nobody actually would be much interested in Postgres. Perhaps you are. If you send a patch, you are actually interested, but p interest from other people also matters a lot for any kind of features as well. Uh, so usually you send emails to uh, pgsql-hackers in this case. If you have a bug fix or if you want to report a, a bug, sending an email to hackers is fine as well. Usually uh, those go through uh, the pgsql-bugs, which has uh, a form on the website, if I recall correctly. I've never actually used it myself, but it happens that we have that. Uh, if you use the form on the website, it gets assigned automatically a bug number, which we sometimes reuse uh, in the commit log itself. Uh, lately, we tend to have in the commit logs themselves a reference to the thread where a given problem is being discussed, which I think is a new trend and it's actually very, very helpful when you want to track past problems and actually to follow up on the discussion about what led to what has been committed. So we get preferences around. Uh, yes, sorry. No, I, I'm just saying that you send it to one of them. Uh, some people like sending things to hackers, uh, sometimes to bug. Uh, I think bugs is preferred because it's in the name of the list itself. Uh, but I have seen, seen a lot of people sending uh, a bug uh, related uh, problem, even on hackers. Uh, hackers look at bugs as well. Uh, I think it's fine to do it. But please, no, do not send to multiple mailing lists because t people tend to think, eh, come on, please don't do that. Uh, we have also, um, when you try to cross post uh, given problem or even email, uh, there may be also some moderation rules uh, based on that. I'm not exactly sure about all the details because I, I try to be a good student, so I don't do it. I just send email to one single list, but no, uh, limit yourself into one single list uh, as much as possible. In case of bugs, one of them is fine, I think. Uh, I would send it to bugs uh, anyway, because it's a bug. Uh, hackers, I mean, hackers is fine as well. It's not, I think, a strong rule. Uh, perhaps people are going to scream after me if I say that just after this presentation, but I, I think it's my personal take on that. Both are fine, because at the end, it's, we want to get something fixed. And hackers are on both mailing lists, uh, mainly. Uh, please prefer pgsql bugs. Uh, as well, so that's my take on it. Uh, so about the patch uh, contents, uh, you have all, of course, the coding itself. Uh, comments are very, very important. Please, please provide documentation about that and tests. So uh, back in the days, uh, if you have a replication related thing, people have been using bash or anything like that. We have a more uh, advanced testing framework uh, which is called tap test based on Perl, compatible down to Perl 9.5, uh, sorry, 5.8.9, uh, which is a very, very hard uh, requirement. So it's still, I don't know when it was released, but it was some time ago anyway. Uh, so we try to make, uh, to maintain certain compatibility such as build for members. Do not complain about that. Uh, so depending on your feature, you may be looking for isolation tests, regression tests, most likely, tap tests. Uh, depending on the requirements of what you have. Uh, they usually are designed not to be too costly, still add value depending on what you have. Uh, you may even send a patch uh, and you may develop tests that are very, very costly, but if you can actually prove your points, it helps people actually reviewing the patch. Even if you send something that takes 10, 20 minutes, it's most likely not going to get merged into the tree. But if it 
helps Sri to prove your point, to say, I have a bug. This bug can only re be reproduced by that given test case, and people are just able to, I don't know, take a tab script, and you actually wrote one, yeah, please uh, send it, because it's always helpful for anybody looking at your patch in terms of review or anything. Uh, a long-running test is not going to be merged, but sometimes it could be reduced in such a way that it brings value and it's not, it does, it does not actually cost much uh, to introduce uh, in the final uh, uh, fix that gets into the, the tree. Yes? Oh, yeah, yeah. Things like that. Is there any preference in maybe how that should be communicated? Uh, so what I tend to do, I, I mean, I have uh, dealt with cases where actually I had to do that myself. Uh, because sometimes you want to, uh, it's a small case. I'm just taking a small example. For example, I had a couple of months ago a bug related to uh, begin commands. And I wanted to trigger errors in some specific code path to make sure that the session is still is in, in a st sane state, because I think it was some folks from Pivot actually who reported that. And they actually forked the code, but we were not doing the actual operation in a really consistent way in Postgres. So what I have been doing was sending a patch uh, to the mailing list that was just C code. That please apply it on top of it, apply this patch, and then what I had was a simple stat check for this flag on this can just trigger an error if you see this flag to be able to reproduce the errors like that. So it depends on the case. But I have been doing that as well. Sometimes for other cases, I have been doing uh, introducing manual slips in a couple of code paths to actually be able to reproduce that reliably as well. Uh, because sometimes you just cannot. You don't have an in infinite number of uh, uh, points that you can plug into it. So hooks have a limitation anyway. So sometimes you may have something which has the shape of a C uh, patch. Uh, and yes, these are actually good to have because if it's only to slow down the code, uh, to have to reproduce a race condition particularly, usually you must, I mean, it's not must, but you, you would most likely do that as well. Uh, so if you have test cases like that, I say yes, please send them. So, so th these are always very, very helpful, yes. So just a description, here's how to implement, here's how to trigger this bug. Yeah, yeah. If you say, for example, if I take, uh, I, I, I've had such stuff also in the past as well, uh, just take a breakpoint here, do that, do that, do that. If you keep precise, reproducible steps, these are absolutely great. I mean, the. I think that these are, in my opinion, high quality reports because you actually show how to reproduce it. If you show how to reproduce it, you already did 80% uh, of the work because you discovered how to reproduce it. I mean, it's 80%. It may be actually more than that. Because after that, it's just actually reproduce, producing a fix for it. If it's possible to reproduce it, yes, please send all your steps. Precisely, I did that, 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 and that. Uh, if you play with a debugger, yes, please do it. I took a breakpoint there, there. And Precise steps are good reports. Quality reports mean a fast fix. Fast, fi fast fix means that you and potentially your customer are going to be happy uh, much uh, faster than what you would expect. Uh, we have a lot of reports with people sending bugs and saying that, oh, I had that and it crashed. And the first reply we do is, we don't know what you did. Uh, please send a backtrace, at least. If you have a reproducible test case, please send it. <laughs> oh, we are limited to guess what it is, and this costs time, and we may not have actually the time to dig into trying to guess what you perhaps did wrong. Sometimes people even have custom extensions that cause the breakage. And you see that if you look at the backtrace, for example. Uh, so it really depends a lot uh, in the things. So if you send a patch, a bug, uh, if you have anything reproducible, yes, please send it. Send your steps. Uh, it's very good uh, to have. So we have, uh, I think I'm running out of time maybe. Uh, so just to go through that uh, quite quickly, uh, we have coding conventions for anything like uh, macros, error formats, uh, signal handlers, and we try to keep the documentation about that uh, quite uh, clean and at least documented. Even if it's far from being complete, it's 
uh, has a lot uh, in that. For example, if you want to do some blocks which don't get indented, it's in the docs. Uh, this is referred into the docs with this link. So if you, can, if you want to write patches, you can always have a look at that. Uh, we have also configuration for editors. You may be a VI, Emacs, or something else guy. Uh, we have also uh, documentation that you can use uh, to make your code uh, easier to reproduce for Postgres following the PostgreSQL coding convention as well. So for regression tests, we have main regression tests in SRC test regress, which are the, the oldest uh, historical ones. Uh, we have since 9.1, uh, I think, since uh, serializable has been introduced, uh, isolation tests uh, to be able to test concurrent behaviors between multiple sessions. Uh, we have, of course, extensions tests. Uh, SRC test modules is more recent than that. Tests in contrib modules. Uh, since extensions have been introduced, we have a huge improvement uh, on that because we have the actual framework to test that more easily. Uh, since 9.4 and in more advanced way 9.6, uh, we have more advanced recovery uh, related tests, for example, for anything related to crash recovery, uh, archiving, uh, also likely uh, logical replication, publication subscription. So we have the basic framework to do, to do that. I have done a lot of work on that. And people use them a lot. Uh, we have them also running in the big farm uh, automatically. So this took a couple of years, but we are really in a good shape, I think, in this area. It's really cool uh, stuff, and we can do much more than what we tended to do uh, in the past. Uh, we have a set of non-secured tests, uh, which you can specify using that. I have that in my environment, but it's on my own laptop, and it's secure, so it's fine. So you can run a set of extra tests, which are for SSL, LDAP, Kerberos, depending on what you install and what you configure as well for your configuration stuff. About the patch format, uh, people have preferences. Yes, no. Uh, so acceptable formats is, in my opinion, anything that can actually be cleanly applied. So uh, Git AM tends to be very talkative and complain quite easily on that. Uh, but usually, if I cannot apply it, and I can just basically apply using a patch dash p1, I'm basically fine with it. Sometimes I have seen patches that, that I cannot actually apply, but if I can read it, say, yeah, I, I can be, I would be able to produce a patch uh, based on that. Uh, so, using things like git diff, uh, git format patch, and adding a version number into the patch you send is actually very, very helpful in following up uh, how the patch versions are evolving as well. Uh, this is usually what you should try to do. Um, so sometimes splitting things into multiple commits also makes a lot of sense. If you have a cool feature, but perhaps you can do first refactoring, which makes sense. These are much easier to commit because you reshape the code in the way you want in a more modular way, and then you get the actual real feature getting done. And you reduce the amount of global diff that your feature uh, introduces improving the readability of the commit uh, and the git history happening in Postgres. So that's my take. If you send a patch, as long as I can apply it, I'm fine. So it's a patch dash p1, as long as it goes through that. I use all commands, uh, any kind of commands, but as long as it's possible to produce something, perhaps it won't comp compile. If it doesn't compile, perhaps it needs some rebasing as well, depending, depending on the cases. But it's usually easy enough to actually see if the patch is here. And if you have a reproducible test case, it's possible to still reuse it and adapt to it uh, directly as well. Um, so I don't know how many patches I have. I have a couple of extra more. Anyway, so we have a commit first manager. We don't have any more time. Uh, a kind of deputy handling all the patches and doing a lot of work on that. This is done by seasoned developers. It means. Uh, Mostly tracking patches, poking at people. Please do it, please do it, please do it. Sending emails and being kind of noisy about su such matters. Uh, we have a CF bot which tests automatically uh, patches. That has been something uh, developed by Thomas Munro. Uh, with a given URL, we have automatic tests on Linux or Windows. People send to, tend to send patches on Linux. Uh, few have Windows environments, so if you send a patch and you see it breaks on Windows, you can actually test that automatically. Uh, I have been abusing of that a little bit to uh, patch the test codes in such a way that some 
tests which are not triggered by default would be triggered by that as well. So you can also abuse a little bit of that. Uh, Thomas Munro uh, has written that. In, it's very, very helpful because you can see the status of all your patches in a given commit fest uh, running. So you can actually follow up if you did something wrong or not, if it requires a rebase, if, if it can still be done. If and for the commit fest manager, it's very, very helpful to see. Um, so about the patch review, we have exchange between authors and reviewers. A patch may be marked as ready for committer at the end, and when it's written like that, the committer looks at it and say, I'm okay to commit it or not. Uh, it depends on the cases. Uh, sometimes the committer looks at it, says, no, it's not quite ready yet, please do that or rework it in this way or this way. It depends really on the flow. Um, and also on the patch uh, difficulty. Uh, usually when you write one patch, please review one patch of equal difficulty to maintain the balance in the force. So as we don't finish in uh, cases where we have a bunch of patch authors sending a lot of cool features with nothing actually getting reviewed. It happens that it's actually the case for a lot of things, but this tends to improve uh, within the last uh, couple of years actually. And reviews are very, very important part of the process because you get used to more code and you gain more experience in trying to break things. Trying to break things is actually the cool part about reviewing stuff as well because you can analyze problems, you can view new code, you can try to analyze new parts of the code and get more familiar with the PostgreSQL code base itself. Uh, usually when you send a patch, people largely underestimate the amount of time it takes to write a patch. You can most likely expect your patch to be rewritten once, twice, or even more. So please make sure that you agree about the shape of the patch with the people you are dealing with uh, to make sure that you don't actually send versions that serves absolutely for nothing. Sometimes people just rush, send a new patch, and somebody comes in and say, no, actually, no, it's not going to happen. It still happens. But uh, you really should be careful about making sure that you have an agreement about something instead of sending uh, 30, 40 versions that actually don't, with most versions actually not mattering much. So a consensus is key. You are not going to have a patch in the shape you designed it first. Never. It's usually not really happens like in 90% of the cases, I don't know. Uh, people come in, you have N persons participating into a given description, you are going to get at least N plus one opinions on it. So make sure that you have a consensus. Uh, it's an exchange, a negotiation with uh, other people. Sometimes you need to drop the ball and accept that other people also have uh, opinions. I mean, it's actually an essential part of the process because people have reasons to say so. If they say so, they have usually good reasons to say so. So it's good to communicate on that and to reach a state where you all actually agree about how the thing is actually shaped. And a complicated patch will never finish the way you actually want it to be. Uh, it usually finishes in a much better shape than you usually proposed. So it, the review process is actually very, very important. So in conclusion of that, uh, I'm just going to say that you need to be patient. Investing time in the community requires energy, time. Uh, sometimes uh, you work in environments that do not provide any of them. Sometimes you work in some cases where you have some of them. Uh, you may rush into having new features, a customer issue that needs an immediate lookup on that. You need to work with that as well, but you have also matters in life, so uh, everybody has a life. Uh, so please be patient with people. Uh, do not work on patches on Friday nights. It's an extremely bad idea. Uh, as a committer for one year in PostgreSQL, in my own experience, it works not only for PostgreSQL, but for anything. Do not commit patches on Friday nights. It's an extremely bad idea. <laughs> So when it comes to Postgres, if you commit a patch and break something, people are going to show up mostly immediately saying, uh, you broke the build farm, please fix us, us up. Because other people are working on it and we want it to be stable, which is a very acceptable position in my opinion. <laughs> 
So uh, it applies. This is really a general rule. If you do th something, uh, make sure that you have, uh, after committing something, room to make sure that you did, didn't de destabilize everything and you can actually uh, come in and at the end perhaps do just a git uh, revert or anything like that. But this doesn't apply only to Postgres. Uh, so help others take new challenges, uh, reviewing new parts of the code you are not familiar, familiar into means that you will get good with this code if you continue to have a look at it. So it's very, very important to have a look at new areas and even if you don't know it, don't hesitate to jump in. Uh, so it's not very fancy, but fixing bug and doing the actual maintenance work requires a lot of work. So if you can come in and help, uh, I think it's as important as doing uh, cool features and stuff. It's even more important because you maintain a stable long-term perspective, which is very, very important for Postgres. Uh, remain polite, respect others. Uh, the PostgreSQL community people is a community that people like working with. Because we try to be, uh, at least we are, uh, we try to be an open community. We deal with each other without any kind of, uh, I would say, I'm not naming any community or anything like that. Uh, but we try to be open to others, to remain gentle to each other, to respect everybody's opinion. Uh, and I'm really grateful for working with this community because actually you feel that you are part of something and you contribute to it. To it for long term, and what you do now is something that you will still see in 10 years from now. In software engineering, you don't see that much uh, around, honestly. So I think that's everything I have. I got questions in the middle, so I got a little bit overboard, I think. <laughs>